Welcome back to Space This Week. This week I'm taking us back to normal services, although this is obviously being posted on Tuesday rather than Monday. I had the day off work, so figured I'd use this opportunity to delay this video to be after Starship's eighth flight test, so I could talk about that. Which is probably the reason that SpaceX scrubbed it, so sorry everyone, it was my fault. But Starship Flight 8 was hardly the only story to talk about. Blue Origin flew another crew of people to the edge of space last week. Firefly Aerospace made history by becoming the first commercial company to successfully land on the moon. Another fleet of lunar payloads was launched aboard Falcon 9 last week. China suffered a launch failure. Soyuz made two launches. And SpaceX unfortunately lost a Falcon 9 first stage in a rare failed landing attempt. All of this and a whole lot more, a lot, lot more in fact. This ended up being one of the biggest ever episodes of Space this week so far. So sit back and enjoy. So yeah, Starship Flight 8 was the reason that this episode of Space This Week is being posted on Tuesday rather than Monday. Like heck, am I going to let Marcus get first dibs on this? Just kidding, of course. Joke's on me this time, eh? <laughs> anyway, if it had launched, while this would have been the eighth flight test of Starship overall, this would have been only the second ever flight of Starship Block 2. Ship 34 would follow on from Ship 33's disastrous outing on Flight 7, during which it was obliterated not that far into its flight. But on that note, last week, SpaceX shared some updates regarding their investigation into this. It reads that the super heavy part of the mission was a success, something that we all already knew based on seeing the thing launch and then make a historic, air quotes, landing in the arms of the chopsticks on the launch tower, which is only the second ever time Super Heavy has managed this. They then went on to say that the Starship vehicle powered up its six Raptor engine successfully, but about two minutes into its burn, a flash was seen in the vehicle's aft section near to one of the Raptor vacuum engines. This area is colloquially referred to as the attic, and it's an unpressurized zone between the base of the liquid oxygen tank and the aft heat shield. Sensors detected a pressure rise in the attic that pointed towards a leak after the flash was seen. About two minutes later, another flash was seen, followed by sustained fires in the attic, which eventually caused all but one of the vehicle's engines to execute controlled shutdown sequences that ultimately led to loss of communication with the ship, with final telemetry data received just over 8 minutes 20 seconds into flight. About three minutes later, the vehicle was seen breaking apart, with post-flight analysis indicating that this was caused by automatic triggering of the flight termination system. The most probable explanation for the loss of the ship was determined to be a harmonic response several times stronger in flight than had been seen during testing, putting increased stress on the propulsion system hardware, with the propeller leaks exceeding the venting capability of the attic area and causing the fires. To ensure it would definitely fare better than its predecessor, SpaceX made a number of upgrades to Ship 34, as well as put it through the longest ever static fire burn of a ship, lasting 58 seconds on the 11th of February. In SpaceX's words, this static fire tested multiple engine thrust levels and three separate hardware configurations in the Raptor vacuum engine feed lines to recreate and address the harmonic response seen during Flight 7. Findings from the static fire were used to enact hardware changes to the fuel feed lines to vacuum wrapped engines, adjustments to propellant temperatures, and a new operating thrust target for Flight 8. To address the flammability potential in the attic section, more vents and a new purge system that uses gaseous nitrogen are being added to the current generation of ships to make the area more robust to propellant leakage. And of course, eventually future ships will sport the Raptor 3 engine, which will mean a reduced volume to the attic section, eliminating the majority of joints that can leak into it. With all that happenings going on with the ship, Booster 15 has had a fairly uneventful pre-flight campaign, with cryo and static fire testing going nominally, though this hardware is more tried and true tested than Ship 34. While Ship 34 is only the second ever Block 2 Starship, Booster 15 is now the eighth Block 1 Super Heavy to fly at this point, so its technology is much more well understood, especially given SpaceX's extensive experience with the broadly similar Falcon 9 first stage boosters. Super Heavy was always much more of a solved problem compared with Starship, which by comparison is a radically more advanced vehicle, which is aiming to achieve something never done before with spaceflight, be a fully reusable orbital upper stage. That means of course being able to survive re-entry, which is why it has that big old heat shield. And if you're wondering why it looks so patchy in this picture, that's because, according to a tweet from Elon, there are about a hundred experiments running simultaneously on it, which is what makes it look somewhat irregular. 
So, yeah, it's a shame that, with all that said, Starship didn't launch yesterday. However, SpaceX have plenty of additional opportunities to launch throughout the week, so I am hopeful that next Monday we can still talk about how the flight went. Hopefully, Ship 34 will get further into flight than Ship 33, and it'll be able to deploy the dummy Starlink payloads, which were spotted being loaded into its cargo bay not long before it was carted off to the launch pad for stacking. Why was the launch aborted though? According to Elon, there were too many question marks about this flight and then they were 20 bar low on ground spin start pressure and that the plan will be to de-stack the vehicles, inspect both stages and then try again in a day or two. So we're probably looking at Thursday at the earliest for the next launch attempt. Back on the 15th of January, we saw the 100th ever launch of Falcon from Launchpad 39A at Cape Canaveral, carrying not one, but two lunar landers. The first of which was Blue Ghost M1, designed by Firefly Aerospace, which, if successful, would become the first ever fully commercial moon lander to complete a lunar touchdown. And on Sunday last week, this goal was realized as it made a successful landing after a month and a half long journey to the moon, kicking Firefly's Blue Ghost class of robotic lunar landers off to an amazing start, with success on the very first go. The Blue Ghost landers are designed to carry small payloads to the moon's surface, and this particular mission was commissioned by NASA for Firefly to deliver a suite of science investigations and technology demonstrators to the moon's Mare Crisium, a 500 kilometer wide basin that's visible from Earth. Earth. Now that the landing has successfully taken place, the lander will begin to operate its payloads for a complete lunar day, which is about the same as two Earth weeks. Following payload operations, the lander will capture lunar sunset imagery and provide data on how the lunar regolith reacts to solar influences during the lunar dusk conditions. It will then continue to operate several hours into the lunar night. I love this now iconic shot of the Earth as a small pale blue dot in the sky with the blackness of space contrasting sharply with the grey surface of the moon with that lovely shadow of the lander there in the middle. The other lunar lander that launched with Blue Ghost on board Falcon 9 was iSpace's second attempt at a lunar landing. Their first lunar lander was launched in December 2022, but the landing attempt failed when the onboard computer wrongly assumed the radar altimeter was faulty, ignoring it, which resulted in the lander running out of fuel and plummeting to the surface and breaking. I'm hoping that things go a little bit better for them on this second attempt. The Hakuto R Mission 2, which has the same objective as Mission 1, will aim to serve as a technology demonstrator lander, with the final goal of providing reliable transportation and data services to the moon. Its journey to the moon is taking a little bit longer than Fireflies. It's planned to take another three and a half months to reach the moon, and upon landing, it'll deploy a micro rover, which will perform an in situ resource utilization demonstration. The subject of moon landers doesn't end there though. Last Thursday saw a major Falcon 9 launch that carried Intuitive Machines' IM2 Athena Lunar Lander, carrying several scientific payloads, including the Japanese Yaoki Robotic Lunar Rover. The primary objective of the mission is to search for water ice at the Lunar South Pole near Shackleton Crater for NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program. It'll achieve this with NASA's Polar Resources Ice Mining Experiment 1, which consists of a drill and a mass spectrometer, and will be humanity's first attempt to demonstrate the feasibility of in situ resource utilization, or in simpler terms, the ability to generate products with local materials. Also on board is a miniature rover called Astro Ant, developed by MIT, and a small lunar hopper that'll explore permanently shaded regions of the moon, developed by Intuitive Machines. There's another lunar rover on this mission as well. This is Colorado-based private space company Lunar Outpost's MAP LV-1 rover. It'll collect vital data and help map the area at the landing site at the Lunar South Pole. If you have a look at the IM-2 lander here, you can see there were a couple of other payloads on board the Falcon 9 as well. First, we have NASA's Lunar Trailblazer satellite, which will orbit the moon and map out regions of water on the lunar surface to determine how its form, abundance and location relate to geology, to help further our understanding of lunar water and the moon's water cycle as a whole. Then there's the Odin satellite developed by Astroforge. This is a prototype spacecraft that'll perform a flyby of a small near-Earth asteroid called 2022 OB5 where it will gather critical imagery of the asteroid, which is suspected to be metallic. All of this is to help gather vital data to pave the way for Astroforge's next mission, Vestry. 
which will see a spacecraft land on the asteroid and attempt to extract resources from it, furthering Astroforge's goal of making off-world resource mining possible. Unfortunately, there were some issues. Astroforge has faced major communication challenges after separating from Falcon 9, including antenna polarization errors, a suspected power amplifier malfunction, and interference at ground stations. Amateur radio operators unexpectedly detected Odin's signal, proving it was operational and receiving solar power. However, later attempts to re-establish contact through global ground stations, including in India, Germany, and the US, were largely unsuccessful due to interference and technical difficulties. Astroforge currently suspects Odin is in a slow tumble and remains committed to further recovery attempts while learning from the experience. Incredibly, there was another payload aboard the Falcon 9, Epic Aerospace's Chimera Geo-1, their first space tug vehicle designed for high energy transfers, packing 1.7 kilometers per second of Delta V. This is heading for geosynchronous orbit, hence the Geo in the spacecraft's name, and it's following Epic Aerospace's Chimera Leo-1, which as you might have guessed based on the Leo, launched to low Earth orbit, which launched in January 2023. So yeah, that one little Falcon 9 carried quite an impressive roster of payload. And it wasn't even a sweat for the rocket. It had enough fuel remaining at main engine cutoff for a landing, which took place on the shortfall of Gravitas drone ship, marking the 100th Falcon 9 first stage landing on this particular drone ship. Less than five hours after the IM-2 launch, another Falcon 9 lifted off, carrying 21 Starlink satellites to orbit from Florida, including 13 with direct-to-cell capabilities. The satellites were successfully deployed, and the Falcon 9 first stage successfully landed, which can't be said for the most recent Starlink mission, which took place on Monday the 3rd of March. While the satellites themselves deployed okay, the Falcon 9 first stage initially landed successfully on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship, but following this, there was an off-nominal fire in the rocket's aft end, which damaged one of its landing legs that resulted in it tipping over. SpaceX posted that while it's disappointing to lose a rocket after a successful mission, teams will use the data to make Falcon even more reliable on ascent and landing. There's no video of the fallover, unfortunately, so on screen is an older Falcon 9 booster that met a similar fate on the drone ship. There were two Soyuz missions last week. Last Thursday, the Progress MS-30 ISS resupply mission launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome with the fairing of the rocket sporting an insignia to celebrate the 100th birthday of Pavel Belyei, who commanded the Voskhod 2 mission, which featured humanity's first ever spacewalk in 1965. And March 2025, this month, marked the mission's 60th anniversary, something commemorated with a logo on the other side of the same fairing. The other Soyuz mission to launch last week was on Saturday from the Pasetska launch site. On board was a GLONASS satellite heading to medium Earth orbit. GLONASS is basically the Russian equivalent of America's GPS. The R7 rocket family has, and continues, to serve Russia very well then, it seems. Something that was made possible thanks to the genius of Sergei Korolev, who was born in what is now modern Ukraine, and was the chief designer of the R7 and director of the Soviet space program. The Soviets may well have not beaten the US to the early milestones in spaceflight, like first satellite to orbit, first man, first woman to reach orbit, etc, etc. You know, it's important to recognize what this sovereign nation has achieved. And while I may still cover Russia's ongoing spaceflight accomplishments in this show, I absolutely do not side with Russia in their ongoing unlawful invasion of Ukraine. And I am so pleased to see my country's leadership, and indeed most of Europe and Canada, take similar stances on the war. And I'm sorry if you don't like it when things get political on this show, but space and space travel are so intrinsically linked to politics that it's not really possible to avoid things like this, I'm afraid. I also try and stay fairly objective when covering launches from China, mostly because of how secretive they tend to be with their launches. For example, we know very little about the payload that was launched aboard a Kuaizhou 1A last Saturday, but we know that it was bound for low Earth orbit and that it also never made it there as the rocket suffered a launch failure, something that isn't being shown on screen because I couldn't find a video of this launch. So what you're seeing is a successful Kuaizhou 1A mission that launched back in September 2024. I can show you the other launch from China last week 
week, this was a Long March 2C, which lifted off from the Jiuquan Satellite Launch Center in northwest China on Thursday, carrying two Superview NEO Earth Observation satellites, which are claimed to be China's highest resolution commercial remote sensing satellites ever. Last Tuesday, Blue Origin launched their new Shepard 30 mission, which carried six crew members to the edge of space for a total mission duration of 10 minutes and 8 seconds, with an apogee of 107 kilometers or 66 miles. On board was venture capitalist Lane Bess on his second flight on New Shepard, his first being on Blue Origin NS19 in 2021, where he also flew with his son Cameron, making them the first parent-child pair to fly to space together. Also aboard NS30 was Spanish mountaineer Jesus Calle, Tu Sha Sha, Richard Scott, Elaine Chia Hyde, and a sixth passenger known only as R. Wilson. On the subject of human spaceflight, NASA's Artemis II mission will of course send astronauts on a mission around the moon and back aboard Orion, and the massive SLS rocket that will launch it continues to take shape in the vehicle assembly building. As you can see, both solid rocket motors have been capped off with their nose cone assemblies. Soon, we'll hopefully see the big orange core stage sat between them as the launch day grows closer and closer. Not long after its launch, the Progress 91 cargo craft successfully docked with the International Space Station's Zvezda service module, delivering three tons of food, fuel and supplies for the Expedition 72 crew. The ISS is still a bit of a hot topic thanks to Elon's bizarre remarks about it being a waste of money, so hey, let's continue the discussions from last week and talk about some more stuff the astronauts are doing up there right now. There has been continued progress into research that includes a process to help improve our understanding of how cement hardens, which could lead to innovations for civil engineering, construction and manufacturing of materials, both on Earth and on future space exploration missions to places like Mars. There's also the cytoskeleton investigation, which is investigating the ways in which the human body responds to microgravity. This experiment is specifically looking at the cellular processes that are related to aging, which could eventually help in the development of countermeasures that can sustain astronaut health and performance and of course this could potentially have huge benefits for clinical medical research on earth nasa also shared a video of a miniature tour of some of the experiments that are happening on the station hosted by starliner turned crew 10 astronaut sunny williams it's only about a minute long so i'm just gonna let it play out here so just to give you an example of one of the experiments that we were we've been working on with folks on the ground these are called astro bees um, so they uh, actually can come off the wall and fly around. Uh, huge opportunities for people to test out uh, guidance navigation control on a quote-unquote spacecraft in microgravity inside here. So we have um, companies, universities, students all flying these astro bees around at different times. Some of them are actually even grabbing onto other satellites that uh, other pieces that we might have floating around and that might help us clean up space debris. We have a tray right here that does some combustion experiments, as well as over here, we've got a couple little micro centrifuges over here that we have plants and animals in at times. Um, right on the other side of Butch is a glove box where we've done some uh, stem cell reach research as well as DNA sequencing. Um, and behind, right behind us where you saw in the beginning, there's an airlock where it uh, can take payloads out of the space station and then with the Japanese robotic arm put it on a platform out there and those could be Earth uh, observation satellites, they could be launchers of other micro satellites, they could be doing all sorts of um, amazing stuff. We were hoping to see the second flight of Ariane Space's Ariane 6 rocket on Monday, but sadly this has been postponed indefinitely due to additional ground operations required for interfacing with the launcher. They tweeted that a new launch date will be announced upon completion of these operations. Lown Aerospace was in the skies last week, but not in space. I decided to showcase a little-known feature of Stock Kerbal Space Program. There are a number of hidden launch sites around Kerbin that are inaccessible until you physically go and discover them. And so I did just that, flying a supersonic aircraft around the planet to all the launch locations and having a fun old time in the process. Now, if this sounds like something you want to watch, then check it out on screen, as well as that other video suggestion from my channel. And of course, big thank you if your name is on the right. My Patreon and YouTube members make all of this content possible, and if you want to help support what I do here, then support via either scheme is always hugely appreciated. You can join using the links below. But that's it for today's episode of Space This Week. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you all next time.